So, good afternoon. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, it's probably been a long day for most of you. We're going to talk about technical SEO, and I'm going to try and keep it as non-technical as I can. Um, the funny thing about technical SEO is that a lot of developers think that SEO is stupid, or SEO is hard, or SEO is something that they really shouldn't be thinking about all that much. And SEO goals for projects are often very ill-defined or not defined at all. Every time some major brand relaunches their website, everyone in the SEO community cringes because they always forget even the most simple basics of things. And I think it's stupid because if you're a web developer or a company owner, you can make so much money by just asking the right questions up front and by going into a project knowing what you have to do to maintain the rankings of a website or, prob or hopefully even make them better. So you have to realize that a badly SEO'd project will never ever get you a satisfied customer. If you deliver a website and nobody ever visits that website, that customer is not making more money to spend on you making that website better. It's as simple as that. I was actually very happy to hear Matt say earlier that we have to think of people as they type something into Google, what, what will happen when they get to a website. I'm like, yeah, well, there's a plugin for that. <laughs> so I want to give you a couple of reasons not to listen. Because this is what usually web developers do. They say, this is marketing, it's not development. They say things like, that's not what my customer asked me to do. This will make us more expensive. This will make us too expensive. And well, some of that might be true. It might make you more expensive, which means that it makes you more money. So there's a plus side to that. It also makes your customer feel like you are truly on top of what you're doing. And you very often hear like, yeah, but we need to listen to the customer. The problem is that usually the customer hasn't thought about most of this enough. You need to help them. You all are the web natives here. You're here at WordCamp. Your customers probably are not. The people who you build sites for are probably not here. And if you are, lucky you still ask all these questions. So there's a lot of questions that I'm going to tell you to ask and, tell, and I explain to you why you should be asking these questions. And then you'll, at the end, come up with like, yeah, there's a lot of things that we know about but that we cannot do. Well, it's perfectly fine to say that. But it's a lot easier when you do it up front and say, OK, so we know that this is something that actually should be done, but we don't have a budget for it, or we cannot do it, or whatever. Then when you go halfway through the project, or you release the new website, and suddenly someone goes, hey, I'm looking up at old URLs in Google, and I'm not getting to the good page on the website. And that's like, yeah, we didn't do the redirects. We talked about that, remember? It's here. You said that would cost us 5K, and, I, and, and you said that was too expensive, so we didn't do it. We can still do it now. It will still cost you 5K, something like that. So we're going to go through the five phases of building a website and the SEO issues that are attached to that. What's important to note is that even though these are five phases in development, it's probably best if you ask all these questions up front. First of all, we start with analysis. Simple stuff. What does success look like? And I know I sound like a boring business consultant as I say that. But what does success look like is probably the single most important question you can, answer, you can get answers from for any customer you ever work for. And then what does success look like is not beautiful, or it has a shiny slider, or it has this color and our logo. No, it's metrics. Visitors, conversions, sales, whatever. Determine those metrics. And 
then also determine how people are coming to your customer's website right now if they already have one, and I assume by now that most people will already have a website. So how are they coming to the site, and what are you coming to do, and are you replicating all of those possibilities into the new site? And if not, why not? Now, that's mostly the boring part, uh, but it is good to ask those questions. Then you get to the design phase, which is something that can either take two days or two years or anything in between, of course. Um, but usually people start right off with like, okay, so we want it to look like this. That's not how this works. SEO starts with thinking about what type of content will I need to put on this site to be found for the keywords that I want to be found for, and how do I structure all of that into one site structure? I'm going to assume that all of you were in Marika's talk here earlier. If not, it'll be on WordCamp TV later on. And there's a lot of content that we've written about how to optimize your site structure. It is really something that you should be thinking about up front. The amounts of sites that we've gone into and have to fix later on because nobody thought about, hey, we need to add this, we need to add that. And then menus that looked very pretty and small in the beginning suddenly turn into behemoths with 10 or 12 menu items because, yeah, we needed to put this in and this in and this in. That doesn't work. Now, as you go through that, there's also things that you need to think about when you're structuring that thing because that menu with 12 menu items, that doesn't work so well on mobile. And mobile used to be something that you could consider. And over the last year or so, we've switched from mobile is something you could consider to a desktop website is something you could consider. Google has announced something called mobile-first indexing, and they've been announcing that for about two years, wherein they look at a website as though it's presented on a mobile phone when they index your site. So when they grab the data from those pages, they look at the mobile version of your site. They announced that, and they've started rolling it out. So currently, about 1% of the sites that we monitor is in the mobile index. And all of the sites that are already in the mobile index were responsive to begin with, so they worked on mobile. But they do look differently on mobile than they do on the desktop. It's not something to be afraid of, because we've not seen any ranking changes or anything that makes me feel really bad about it. But not having a mobile website is not going to last you anymore. And related to that, there is something else that's very important, that's speed. How fast should this website be? How much money are we willing to invest into making this the fastest website in our area? And yes, speed is something that you can differentiate yourself with from your competition. A faster website performs better. For users, it does better in search as well. And that, the importance of that is only getting bigger. So much bigger that Google is here with an entire booth with a team that those of you who are also in the SEO community will recognize, because everyone in the SEO community thinks of that team as the AMP team. The funny thing is, you know what they call themselves here? They call themselves the Developer Relations and WordPress team, because that is the same thing. Their WordPress team is their AMP team, and vice versa. How they look at the web is about openness, and AMP is part of how they perceive the open web can work further. If you get a chance to talk to Paul Bacaus, he's here. He's one of the Googlers. He has an awesome website, paulbacaus.com, which is a very good example of what AMP can look like. That entire site is only AMP. There is no normal HTML version of that site. He, he coined the term for that, which is canonical AMP, and that's what they're pushing towards. They're pushing towards all of us building our sites in AMP HTML and not in normal HTML. Now, I used to be very against all of this, 
But I have to say, the AMP HTML spec is by far the fastest moving web spec I've ever seen. I pity sometimes that it's not a W3C spec and that it's not as open as some of the other ones. But at the same time, the specs that are open like that, the CSS specs and all the things that we know we can do with all of that, took years to come into somewhat of a fruition. I got my first dips with WordPress back in 2006 when I started a website called CSS3.info. I was doing a thing called CSS3 previews in which I showed people what CSS3 would look like and how that would work. It took eight years for mainstream browsers to go from having that spec out there to actually implementing that and, be, and allowing that to happen. It took less than six months for a large portion of the web to adopt AMP and build pages in AMP HTML. This is truly a very, very fast effort in terms of how web standards evolve. So it's something that you really should be looking at and discussing with your clients. Because they will be asking you about AMP pages sooner or later. It's better if you ask them, hey, do you know what this is? This is how it works. We can do this and this and this with it. Then you need to think about international, especially here in Europe, because um, as painful as it is to say, this is usually something that comes up in Europe and that they forget about in the US. If WordPress had been built in Europe, WordPress would have had multilingual baked in from the start. Unfortunately, it does not, so it's something you need to think about and it's something you need to work on. But it also means that you need to think about how to tie languages and things on sites together. If you have an English site, a French site, and a German site, how are you going to make sure that all of the important content is in all three of them? And are you aware that the content needs to be ranking in keywords that people there actually use, not the ones you translated through Google Translate? Because that's not how international SEO works. So talk about that with your clients, and then think about things like hreflang. Now, this is about the most complicated thing that we've ever created in the SEO world. Um, SEOs go mad over it. It's almost as hard as CSS, uh, not much harder. Um, but it is something that a lot of SEOs make a lot of mistakes with. It would probably be and be better left in the hands of web developers because they can actually read and follow instructions. So please, you guys do it, and don't ask SEOs to do it, because most SEOs I've seen do it, they break it. Now, as you have all these types of content and all these other things on a website, there's something else that you need to think about. Google is pushing, along with AMP, a system called schema.org, which pushes metadata. It's basically telling Google what is on a page. The funny thing that most people don't realize is that every AMP page has a block in the source code that is like a full JSON LD block of code, which has everything around about that page in a very easily machine readable state. What you can do with schema.org is almost limitless, especially because it's an extensible thing. But if you go to schema.org and you look at like what these schemas are, that's basically a taxonomy for the entire world. It goes from this is a local business, a local business, a hairdresser, or something like, and you can specify very precisely what is on a page. And by doing that. You're helping Google and other search engines being just announced even better support for it. You're helping them understand your site better. There's also a schema now for breadcrumbs. And actually, this morning, I got permission from Google. I haven't even told my team this yet. Uh, I got permission from Google to put the breadcrumb schema that we can generate in Yoast SEO onto every page, regardless of whether there's actually breadcrumbs on that page which means that we can show Google the structure of your website without even having the breadcrumbs. Now, I still think having the breadcrumbs is a good idea, but showing Google the structure of your site in a structured way like that will allow them to better understand the structure of your website far more easily. 
Then there's accessibility. And I can't stress this enough. Accessibility and SEO go hand in hand. Think of Google as a blind person, and most of what you will do will be right. Also, you as a community have a responsibility to build stuff that people can use. So it is OK for you to say, this is the bare minimum of accessibility level that we will deliver. It is truly OK to say, no, we cannot do that like that, because nobody who is slightly uh, who has some form of trouble with using that web page cannot use it. Of course, sometimes that means that you have to make some fallbacks for things, and that it is not as easy for someone who is using a, a, an assistive device to do that thing as it is for someone who does not use that assistive device. That's fine. But have some basic level of accessibility. And when doing that, you'll find that Google actually uses most of that as well. Now, in all of this, it's important that you need to allow for growth, not just in menus, but in how you think about all these things and how you build all this. That's why WordPress is so awesome, because you can always throw in an extra plugin and do something extra. If you're not using WordPress, it becomes a lot harder. Now, during the development phase, there's two things that I think you really should be thinking about. First of all, if you add plugins to add functionality, that's awesome. But think about what they do to your website. Think about the SEO impact and the speed impact of those plugins. And some plugins are better than others in terms of how they work for the user, but uh, some plugins are also better than others in how they work for your SEO, in how they add CSS and JavaScript and all these things to the front end that you don't really need, but that slow the site down. This is a continuous battle. And then there's the thing that I think actually is probably the most important thing that you need to remember today if you only want to remember one thing. That is, if you're going from website A to website B, and the URLs change, and you do not make redirects, you have made a mess. I'll tell you a nice example. We have a bank in the Netherlands who used to rank number two for the word loan, which is something that's worth quite a bit of money. They did a redesign, and they forgot to redirect the page they had for the word loan to the new page they had for the word loan. They lost that ranking, and they never recovered it, because they still today have not put that redirect in place. <laughs> and I see all of you go like that, but to be honest, this happens on a daily basis with the biggest brands in the world. So please talk to your customer about hey, we need to do redirects. These are the old URLs. This will be the new ones. If we have a list here, we can make an Excel file. And then you know what? There's a plugin that can do redirects where you can Im import CSV files. It's all very useful. OK, and then you go to the later phase. You've developed that thing. You're, you're good to go. You, you're going into publication. You need to test that website. And I would urge you, if you're building a slightly larger website, to automate that testing process. Because if you can automate that testing process, you can run it again when you do a small update. So if you update with WordPress or a plugin, and you can rerun your acceptance testing because you've automated it, you can save yourself a lot of time and a lot of embarrassment. Now, automated acceptance testing is not something that we've done a whole lot of in the WordPress world. We're now working on it at Yoast, and we're having some very awesome results. We'll definitely share about that. But it is something that you should really be thinking about. How can I test these things without having to test it manually all the time? And then everyone's happy. Website's launched. You're, you're all going, yay! And then you tell absolutely nobody or you don't. Of course, you need to go out there and promote that new website. You can be proud of what you built, right? If, you, if you're not willing to tweet about or Facebook about a new website that you've launched, then look deeply at why am I not willing to do that for my customer. And maybe next time, don't take that project. 
So help them, because the funny thing is that getting links and getting a bit of promotion for a website, only just a few links will already help so much in getting that new website doing well. A few tweets, a link from your, from your website as a developer can help your customer rank like that, if it's, especially if it's a smaller business. Now, the opposite of that, the link in the footer back to your own website is not something I'm the biggest fan of, because it looks weird for everyone. It's a bit like, yeah, we've built this, and I, I've built this house, and I'm going to keep this poster up in front, in front of the house forever and ever and ever. <laughs> that doesn't work. But it, you can make deals about that, and you, if you give them a discount and, they, uh, and you do something about that, that's OK. But please make sure that you discuss this up front with your client. Now, we've launched that website, and then we go into maintenance mode. And that's always boring and the part where everyone makes mistakes. Google Search Console still doesn't have enough users. And it will never have enough users until every website on the planet that wants to be in Google is in Google Search Console. So if you have a website, you add it to Google Search Console, and you discuss with your customer who will look at those emails and who will action them. And Google sends out a lot of emails. So be ready for that. Especially when you do AMP, they will tell you like, hey, you're, you've got social sharing buttons on the normal version of this page, but you don't have them on the AMP version of this page. Emails like that. Now, I can tell you that some of them you can absolutely ignore if you want to. But someone needs to look at those because there are also messages where it says, hey, in the last few days, we've suddenly seen a spike of 404s on your website. We've seen a spike of errors. Look at that. Go into that. Fix that. That's not something that can wait for two weeks, because if it waits for two weeks and your customer loses all its rankings, who's to blame? You. Then there's this thing called security that we talk a lot about in the WordPress world, except in contributor days, because yesterday the security table was awfully empty. Um, but it's really important. A hacked website is absolutely the worst thing that can happen to you in terms of SEO. Trust me, we've seen enough. We've stopped doing our site reviews, but when we were still doing our site reviews, about one in 100, sometimes two in 100 in bad times, of those people requesting reviews were coming to us. And they were saying, yeah, we've suddenly lost all our rankings. And then we had to look at the website for about two minutes and tell them, yeah. So here's a link to Sukari. Get your, uh, get your hack cleaned up. You've been hacked. Then resubmit the site to Google and wait for a bit. Usually takes a month, two months, sometimes, uh, sometimes it goes faster, but then you'll be back. But that's all we did at that point. And no, we didn't charge those customers because we're not like that. But this happens a lot more than you think. It really, really is pretty common for people to say, I've got an SEO problem. And then you look at the site and you're like, yeah, you've been hacked. So once you've done all of this, you got to go back into analysis. Because, well, you've launched that site, and you're maintaining it, and you're doing all of that well. But things can be done better. And I'm always appalled by how bad a lot of development agencies follow up after they've delivered a site. Because that's when you can start making real money. You can start saying, hey, we've built this for you. Now we see this going well, but this could be slightly better. Let's do that. As with a lot of these things, um, it's a process. And as with any good process talk, it wouldn't be complete without an ugly image. But this is a continuous cycle. It's also infinite, which my designer did very well, I think. Um, I really want to urge each and every one of you to think about these things and use them in your sales process. 
Because I think everyone who does this as a development agency or as a single developer can make so much more money and lead to so much happier clients by doing this right. And yes, that means a lot. we need a lot less SEOs in the world. But I can tell you that these conferences are a lot more fun than the average SEO conference. <laughs> so that's a good thing. There's a couple people here that know. Jono on our team, Reese there. I mean, this is different, right? Yeah. It's, it, people like each other here. <laughs> so more web developers that do things well, less SEOs is a good thing for the planet. So please follow my advice. Thank you. I swear every time I hear this man speak, I come away completely enthused by this stuff. And yet every time between those talks, I kind of fall into those same habits that you just described. So it's good to top the fuel level up every now and again. Um, we will have questions, I imagine. Who's got a question? I've got one right over there, a white t-shirt. <laughs> I only did that to fast. see him do that corner again. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get these throwing cubes. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you for a great talk. When doing the redirects you talked about, I'm going to remember that always. Often we get into the discussion of the pages that disappeared. Should they go to the 404 or should they go to fun page? Because the client always wants to the fun page. And we often say it's 404. <laughs> well, 404 is never the right solution. Because if you decide to delete it on purpose, then it should be a so-called 410, which is a HTTP status code for this content has been deleted. And then Google will take it out of the search results and will, no, and will not come back as much. So that means that the link leaves the search results a lot faster. And by doing that, people will not have the incredibly annoying experience of clicking on a link in, in Google and reaching a 404, because that is a very bad experience. Yeah. Now, if you have multiple pages that disappear and you want to redirect them to the home page, to me, that is a weird thing. That usually means that you've not thought enough about, OK, what content did we have and where should it go now? So I would urge you to put more thought into it and make sure that the pages do not disappear. I can honestly tell you that in an SEO project, I've never ever seen a site get smaller. <laughs> so one page websites uh, uh, do not exist for SEOs. Th these are not a thing. And um, uh, almost every website I've worked on professionally has gone from like 10,000 to 100,000 pages, more likely than from 100,000 back to 10. So think about that more. And if you have to do a redirect, a redirect to the home page for a large number of pages is usually a pretty bad idea. So please then do a redirect to a page that's, le that's at least topically related to what the page was on. Clear? Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Next. The one up front here. You can see better than I can then. <laughs> <laughs> faster, 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 faster. <laughs> I want a question right over there next time, okay? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, hello, Toss is my name. Thank, thanks for the talk. Um, is there a time where you can stop the redirect? Half a year, or is there anything you can recommend? Yes. I c there is something I can recommend that you're not Never. Gonna, uh, you're not going to like it. Never. <laughs> Why is that then? Because even after four years, Google still comes back. It, Google and every search engine in the world has a very hard time really forgetting URLs. Yes. I wish it were different. And I think we'll need to get to a future where it is slightly different. But um, we call it a permalink in WordPress for a reason. <laughs> the only thing annoying about that is that you can change your permalinks. So, but a permalink is a permalink. It is something that is permanently a URL. A URL in the HTTP standard is not something that can go away. Yes, but uh, if, if we tell Google that this link is uh, for the future, the other link, it doesn't change they anything in the index? Uh, it should. It doesn't enough. So there's a, uh, 
everyone knows that, or everyone, most developers know a 301 and a 302. Mm -hmm. So 302 is temporary, 301 is permanent. You've also got 307, which is a better sort of temporary <laughs> direct. And you've got 308, which is go there and never come back here. I wish they would support that. <laughs> you can take it up with them at their booth. Uh, there's a question just here. He's standing up already. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Nir. Thanks for the talk. Um, your story about the, the bank and the loan, wherever and went this. I'm taking the angle from another perspective that if, uh, you know, if the bank didn't do anything about it, then there probably wasn't any real value to that second ranking. <laughs> Otherwise, people would have made some action happen. I, I any was comment at, on that? I was at that bank um, three months later. It, we didn't have the authority to change it at that point. It was costing them a lot of money. But as banks go, some of these processes are, it's sometimes more expensive to put in a redirect than you'd think. <laughs> yep. And but more expensive than the value of the ranking. Apparently, it's stupid. I, I mean, it, 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 this, this happens. And I, it, there's a, an, another good friend of mine who works at a grocery uh, store in the Netherlands. It's blue. Everyone who's Dutch now knows what I'm talking about. Um, they have wrong canonicals on some pages. Fixing that will make them more money, but it's the, the cost to fix it is too high, So th and their budget won't cover that, so no, it's not happening. Stuff like that happens all the time. It is very frustrating. Yeah. I'll be fair, this even happens on WordPress.org, where we have things that we need to fix and we don't have the resources to fix them. Yeah. I've seen Thank that you. too. Uh, we have one oh. right in the middle. Uh, I have the microphone. Not here. Right, I'm going <laughs> to make this man work. <laughs> That's okay. Keep standing. This might be a slight plant. Um, you um, mentioned the importance of analysis, so you can go back and make business cases for doing more exciting stuff, etc. Would you say that the same kind of thinking and principles, as you've discussed, apply to analytic setups in the same way they do to SEO? Uh, yes. I, uh, in, 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 they, they apply to pretty much everything, which is why it's, the slides like this are both very beautiful and very bullshitty. Um, this, this applies to your content, this applies to your SEO, this applies to your analytics, this applies to life. Uh, I, that's about as deep as I'll make it today. <laughs> uh, over this way, please. Uh, this is Andrea from WordLift. Um, I just would like you to bring uh, up a topic that uh, you raised on Twitter that I found uh, extremely interesting about uh, fake traffic and how much SEO tools and crawlers are generated traffic that is actually not driven by humans, but by machines. Mm -hmm. And also I would like to know if you see this as a threat for the industry that is built on organic traffic, that machines are taking over you know, humans. So let me reiterate what I said on Twitter, which is what you're referring to. So Jono and I were looking at the logs for Yoast.com, the crawl logs. So Google comes by and crawls your site and, and indexes all those pages. Now Google does that, uses a lot of bandwidth on your site, but they send you visitors in return. So there's ROI on, on them coming to do that to your site, and that's all good. For Yoast.com, I think it's currently between 30 and 40% of all our traffic is crawlers. And only a small portion of that is Google. Most of the, that is crawlers like Baidu, Yandex. Bing, and well, then there's the even worse group of things, that's link research tools. <laughs> so what they do is they crawl the web to mimic how Google indexes the web mm -hmm. so that SEOs can look at that and then do better SEO, ostensibly. I, that's the thought. I think it's rather horrible that we allow that to exist in the way it exists today. The web has always been like everyone can access any page for free and can do all that. But that is now leading to us where we have seven servers running Yoast.com. 40% of traffic is literally servers that are running to serve specific bots. Mm -hmm. I know from my time when I was at The Guardian that we had specific servers for Bing, like literal entire servers <laughs> that were just there because Bing was scraping the site. And Bing wasn't sending any traffic. 
<laughs> or very little. I mean, the <laughs> ROI was definitely <laughs> negative. So I think that, that that is something that we need to get better at, and we need to figure out a way to do in a more sm in a smarter way. Now there is something called common crawl that crawls the web, and that everybody can access that data. I wish they could would all just get together and say, okay, common crawl is not going to do all the crawling to everyone, and then all these tools can then use the common crawl database to build everything on top of that. I think that would be better. Um, that is a very open source way of thinking, uh, thinking so it's not a surprise that I would think like that. Um, but it's, it's a tough thing to think about, and I, well, I'm not done with my thinking about this yet, but I've definitely suggested, like, well, we could just block them in WordPress. <laughs> if we block, in, if we as WordPress community decide to block some of those crawlers, we block literally 30% of the web for them, so we make their database useless. So we force them into common crawl. Mm -hmm. It's something to think about. It's not something <laughs> that we really necessarily need to do now. <laughs> So write is, uh, so if you install your Sysio, we do an indexation check to check whether your site is indexable. That is absolutely a crawler that does the, that same thing. There's an ROI there in terms of it grabs your home page mm -hmm. to see whether you're indexable. That, that, that's something that you get back. For most of these crawlers, you get nothing back. The web as a whole gets not much back. And there are a lot of trees and electricity wasted to do all that. I think that's something that we, well, we, we could probably do that better than we're currently doing it. Yes, I, I confess I'd never heard of Common Crawl until you tweeted about it. Who is it? Who's doing it? So it's, it's a group of ex-Googlers, okay. funnily enough, that started it. And um, there's a, a, a relatively cool group of people attached to it. Mm. So if even uh, Danny Sullivan, who's the current search liaison for Google, is on their board. So okay. there is some some good connections there to people that have actual crawl infrastructure to do things nicely. So I think uh, it could actually be something real, and, and we should probably support it. Sounds good to me. We've got time for one or two more questions. Hello? Hello? No. We have um, one down here. Is it on? Okay. Before my question, I have two comments regarding um, deactivating the um, 301 redirect. <laughs> um, don't forget that um, besides searching giants, we may have backlinks or social share, so it's important to, to keep them forever uh, because they don't hurt. They're just there. If they are not used, it's okay. Well, they don't hurt if you only have a few of them. If, yeah. you, if you keep redesigning your website, it becomes very annoying. Yeah. So yeah. don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, regarding the, the, um, the redirects and missing the redirects when, when you, you make a new website, so I just want to comment that we have seen two of the major newspapers in Portugal uh, making that mistake, and they just bro broke all of their history from one day to, to, to the other. Okay. So and my question is regarding um, HRF langs. Uh, um, so do you think it's okay? So if you have a, um, a shop, a WooCommerce shop, that you, you have in three languages, but it's not really specific uh, for the country, do you think it's okay to only keep the, the language part of the, the code and not the language plus region. That so is how hreflang works. So you can okay. set either a language or a language plus region. Yeah. Uh, and if, if you had just have three languages, then just setting three languages is fine. OK, because I see a lot of mistakes there. Using so the yeah, there's a lot of mistakes in how people deal with that. It's, it's a bit of a weird spec, but it's not <laughs> as bad as some people make it out to be. Um, but, yeah, no, just the language is fine and would probably solve a lot of things for a lot of people. Okay, we have a question. Where's it going to stop? <laughs> there. there. <laughs> <laughs> and then one in the middle, and I think that'll be all. Hi, uh, Kenneth from Denmark. Um, we build a lot of sites uh, which are multilingual e-commerce sites. And uh, many of them has uh, a Canadian site, an Australian site, a English site, a, a lot of English mm -hmm. yes. sites. How should we uh, proceed with the, yeah. The with AS. hreflang. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you can fix that with hreflang. Would it be duplicate? No. Uh, it, it would be a duplicate, but it's not necessarily problematic. But with hreflang, you can actually fix that. So you can say, this is the ENGB version, this is the ENAU version, et cetera. 
just like the Germans can do D E D E and D E uh, uh, was A C H and yes. and add A T. I, Austria is always like that should be A U, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so if we do that, that that would be. That would be, yeah, but you need to do that on a page level, so not on like the home page, but on a page by page basis, which is what makes it so annoying. Okay. Thank you. If anybody's watching us on the live stream from Australia, uh, I'm sure he apologizes for that. <laughs> uh, one more here, and then we're done. Hello, I have a question about the redirections. Uh, what is the better choice if I want to remove? Uh, or some pages, I want to remove some pages from my website. For example, I used to have a service, but I no longer have it. Uh, is this a good thing to just remove those uh, pages and forget them, or uh, is it a better option to redirect them to another page? If, the, if you don't have any related services anymore, mm -hmm. then I would remove them and set up four tens so that they disappear from the search results. Um, if you have related services, I would probably keep a page explaining that you don't do that particular service anymore, but that you have these other services. So give people another option if you can. Especially if it's a service that you've been advertising and people have been linking to, mm -hmm. it's a bit of a shame to let them go. Yeah. So if you can redirect them somewhere useful, then either like by writing a bit of text and telling them like, okay, so this is the service we used to have, but we we don't do that anymore. But we do have this. That's a bit more work, but if that leads to a couple more customers, that's usually worth it. So I w that's what I would probably recommend in most cases. Thank you. And folks, that's where we're going to leave it. If anyone has any further questions on any of this stuff, uh, you may be able to find some people from the Yoast team. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm sure they'll all be very, very eager to help. Will you give it up, please, one last time for Yost? Thank, Thank you. you.